Welcome to this week's Meet the Democrats. Meet the Democrats is where we take a look at national, state, and local news through a democratic perspective. This week's show, uh, we are going to continue our series on the ballot. We do have elections that are coming up on September 30th, so we're going to take a look at uh, two of the candidates who are running for school board who are up against uh, Republicans in their districts. And we're also going to sit down with our Lafayette Parish Democratic Executive Committee Chairman, big title, uh, Frank Flynn. Frank Flynn and I are going to go through and we're going to talk about uh, individual races uh, that are going to be running for uh, September 30th. But, as always, first up in the news. Today, the show that we are premiering today on Monday, September 11th, we are now five years later after the terrible tragedy that was 9-11. But we have to ask the question, are we any safer? It's been five years now. The 9-11 Commission report, well, sadly, none of it or very little of it has been implemented. Uh, we still are having our ports that are basically wide open where less than 10% of all the cargo that is coming into our ports is left unchecked and unscreened. As was pointed out on a last show, uh, most of those uh, uh, containers are also being found now to be smuggling in a lot of these illegal immigrants that we're having problems with. Uh, we can't take hair gel on a plane for fear of dastardly deeds. However, uh, the cargo that's being placed inside the belly of the plane isn't being checked. So one has to ask the question, um, are we really any safer? Um, tens of thousands of illegal immigrants are still crossing our border on an almost daily basis, and the Republican leadership has still yet to even come close to passing a comprehensive bill on border security. Unbelievable. This administration likes to trumpet that we haven't had another 9-11. Well, I hate to point out, we still had 9-11, guys. We still had 9-11, and we have done very little to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Um, it seems unbelievable to me that we are literally hemorrhaging money uh, over in Iraq right now when we can't invest in our own security here in our country. Unbelievable. Um, our troops are literally in the middle of a civil war now over in Iraq, and Osama bin Forgotten uh, is rejoicing now because he seems to now have free and total access in Pakistan. Today they announced, Pakistan announced, that they are going to allow the Taliban to stay in Upper Kyrgyzstan uh, free from any government intervention from the Pakistanis. Unbelievable now that they have free reign up there and that they're putting down roots again. Unbelievable. Last week was Labor Day, and we are seeing some Labor Day woes. That's right. Um, I have to ask the question, and I did in my column this week in, on the Daily Advertiser's website, are we forgetting what Labor Day really is all about? Uh, in Louisiana, uh, per capita, Louisiana workers earn less than their counterparts in every other state in the nation. Forty-nine other states, our workers earn less. Unbelievable. And the good news uh, for everyone is that productivity is up. One would think, though, that these uh, business owners and huge corporations would then pass down some of that money that they're earning because of the produ increased productivity down to the people who are actually doing the productivity. But that's not happening. We're actually seeing a huge disparity of wages basically being flatlined and in a lot of cases actually being decreased to the average worker. So the trickle-down economics is definitely not working. It's been 10 years uh, since the minimum wage was actually addressed. And uh, adjusted for inflation, this was an interesting statistic that I found, adjusted for inflation, a typical person working full-time in 1973 earned $42,573. However, today that number has dropped to $41,368. That's a drop of $1,200. Now, granted, those numbers have been adjusted for uh, inflation, but we're actually backsliding here. This isn't a good thing, okay? Not in the least. Healthcare costs are skyrocketing with no end in sight, and a record 46.6 million Americans do not have health care benefits whatsoever. This number has climbed each year the Bush administration has been in power, and since, 2000, since the year 2000, 3 million people, that's right, 3 million people have lost 
their employer provided health care insurance. The businesses can no longer afford to send that, uh, to have that policy available for their employees. Or worse yet, if it is available, the employees can't afford to buy into it. This is only going to increase our problems and the long lines for health care that we're having these problems with. Uh, it's only going to further strap our local community governments and our state governments because we have to take care of people when they're sick. Um, it seems unbelievable to me. Um, two key points I'd like to make here. Uh, GM and Ford are just two of the largest uh, corporations in our country who are begging begging us to come up with some sort of a single-payer health care system so that we can make sure that all Americans have the benefit and the access of affordable health care treatment. And if we don't do something about it, we're going to continue to see the problems that we're seeing today. Good jobs here are leaving this country, and it's because co companies cannot afford to pay their workers, uh, to, can, to, to pay to have these benefits passed on to them. Uh, it's unbelievable because of the skyrocketing. Now, let's compare and contrast, though, here. Mind you, my heart is not uh, going crazy uh, and pumping out of my chest for these huge corporations, who many of which are showing record profits. It just so happens, though, the two uh, American uh, motor companies that I just mentioned, both of those are having significant problems, and all of them are, are equating that to each individual car, each unit that they produce, $1,500 of that or more actually goes to the health care benefits for their employees. So that's a staggering number. More information is available on this uh, uh, in my column, the left blog, on theadvertiser.com. So I urge you to go and check it out on there for some more facts, insight, and statistics. The death penalty is being sought for U.S. soldiers accused of the Iraqi murders. Uh, this, to me, is especially troubling, um, not because uh, for any remote stretch of the imagination that I would not want to see people who murdered someone uh, brought to justice. My problem is, though, that all of these troops that are being accused of this have actually said that they had direct and specific orders to do what they did. Uh, it's unbelievable that actually, and here's the quote, uh, the soldiers uh, said that they were told uh, their rules of engagement for this mission were to kill all military age males during this operation. That's what they were told by their bosses, okay? And from what I understand about the military, it's not like you get together and brainstorm about what your missions are. You're pretty much told what to do, and you've got to go and do it. Uh, so it seems to me that we're not only scapegoating uh, these young men, we're also using them as the sacrificial lambs to cover up for this administration's failed policies over in Iraq and this failed war that we've now found ourselves in. Um, Bush denies the Pentagon's uh, Iraqi assessment. You know, this man has been trumpeting for years now that he has done everything that his troops on the ground have asked him to do. Hasn't he? We've heard it all the time. But yet now he's poo-pooing all of their reports that are coming out of the Pentagon now. Uh, the Pentagon issued a bleak report on Iraq describing spreading sectarian violence and increasing complex security problems in Iraq. Uh, they report that the death squads are increasing, uh, not necessarily a good thing, obviously, targeting mainly Iraqi civilians. So guess what? There's a huge change now. They are, not, they are no longer going out and necessarily targeting us, targeting our troops. Now they're targeting themselves. They're targeting other Iraqis because of this sectarian violence that we're hearing about. Uh, this report is the latest in a series required by Congress, and it warns of a Sunni-led insurgency. It still remains potent and viable. Uh, however, uh, just a day after this report, uh, with lipstick in hand, uh, President Bush grabbed the pig and began to apply. Uh, that's right. Still uh, uh, attempting to tie Iraq to the war on terror, uh, President Bush uh, linked the two yet again, saying that the world depends on victory uh, in the war on terror, and that depends on victory in Iraq, so Americans will not leave until victory is achieved. What? 
this man seems to be on a different planet. Um, uh, this comes at a time where more and more Republicans are refusing to drink this administration's Kool-Aid. Uh, more and more of them facing the brutal numbers that they're seeing actually out in their districts while they're facing re-election. Uh, they're quickly distancing themselves from this administration and its failed policies, um, which is quite amazing. Uh, more information uh, can actually be found on our website. Just click on Meet the Democrats and go to the show notes for this episode. We'll have links to all the facts. Again, don't believe anything I'm saying right here. Verify it for yourself. There are several independent news links that you'll be able to track this information down for yourself, especially since our uh, news media is not covering it. Heightened political rhetoric uh, about the war on terror. We talked about this a little bit earlier. Uh, Republicans are definitely desperate, and we can see it right now. As a matter of fact, if you watched any of the Sunday shows last week, you were probably able to click between any of the shows at any given time, and it seemed like you were watching the same darn show. It was uh, uh, a different puppet but the same puppet master, because they were all saying the same darn things. Obviously, a memo released by Karl Rove earlier in the morning told them exactly what to say, but they're definitely denying the problems that they have. Let's, let, let's count just a few of the issues that we have. Osama bin Forgotten is uh, gone. We don't know where he is, and according to the president, uh, he doesn't, not only does he not know where Osama bin Laden is, but he doesn't really spend that much time thinking about it. Um, Iraq is in a civil war. Um, that's basically undisputed at this point. Um, Iran and North Korea are now nuclear powers. Uh, the Taliban is taking back control of Afghanistan and now part of, a large part of, Pakistan. Uh, Al-Qaeda has moved to northwest Pakistan and huge gaps remain in the security here at home. Uh, Bush is sounding like a broken record because all we keep hearing is stay the course, stay the course. What course, Mr. President? What course? Our troops are over there fighting. They don't know what they're there for anymore at this point. The Iraqis are literally fighting amongst themselves, and we're in the middle catching fire for it. It's unbelievable, and it's completely disturbing. However, most disturbing is ABC News plans to air this week a program called The Path to 9-11. Uh, this film claims to be an objective, I'm using quotes here, an objective telling of the events of 9-11 that led up to 9-11. In fact, the film is largely fiction. Uh, that's right. And key scene from the uh, film involves President Clinton's national security advisor, Sandy Berger, uh, uh, stating who uh, was actually quoted as, uh, freezes in a dithering apprehension when a CIA agent reports that he has Osama bin Laden in their sights and he w is asking for permission to take him out. That's what the film depicts. However, according to Richard Clark, the former counterterrorism czar underneath Daddy Bush, the Clinton administration, and again, uh, W, underneath all of them, Richard Clark says that this scene is utter, utterly invented. Utterly invented. Never even happened. It's 180 degrees from what really happened. Uh, this information is backed up by the 9-11 Commission report, uh, who uh, uh, basically uh, describes exactly what happened in this event. Uh, know that uh, this Hollywood depiction of what happened uh, the, or the events lining, uh, leading up to 9-11 is complete Hollywood fiction. It's a made-up movie. So please do not believe what you watch on this. And contact ABC and ask them if they're going to put together a package and call it news and label it as a, an accounting of what really happened. They might want to actually find out what really did happen before they put their name on it. Again, don't take my word for it. Log onto our website, check out our show notes underneath Meet the Democrats, and you'll be able to see the links to all of this information on there. Don't take our word for it. Check it out. Keith Oberman, uh, you know what, this guy is quickly becoming my new hero. Keith Oberman actually took uh, some time to nail Rumsfeld uh, this past week. Rumsfeld came out swinging just before uh, Labor Day, talking to the Veterans Administration, where he basically called anyone who doubts or lacks the, the chutzpah to want to remain in Iraq and fight this war over there so that we don't have to fight it here, he basically called us anti-American. He basically uh, threw down the gauntlet. Well, Keith Oberman stood up to him. And in a six-minute presentation, Keith Oberman nails uh, Rummy on all of these points. I strongly urge you to log on to our website. We have a link on there. Check out this and watch. It's probably be the best six minutes you spent all week. Moving on, local elections. 
We have a lot of different elections that are going to be happening on September 30th. Please mark your calendars. Make sure that you're going to be turning out to vote on September 30th uh, for this election. We have a lot of different races going on. Here are just some of them. The entire school board is up for election right now uh, for Lafayette Parish. We strongly recommend that you get out and support our Democratic candidates. Uh, mayor and city council in the parish for the following cities, for Broussard, Karen Crow, Youngsville, Scott, and Doucin. All of those areas, the council and the chief of police, as well as uh, the mayor, are all up for election. So all of these individuals, you're going to definitely need to turn out. Now, there's also going to be a lot of uh, tax issues and other questions that are going to be on the ballot. I strongly recommend you check out our website. We're going to have frequently updated information on there so that you can find the facts so they make an informed decision when it comes to voting. September 30th, don't forget about it. Um, you can also, if you have any other questions, if you're outside of Lafayette Parish and you're now watching us on Cox Cable, we strongly recommend that you check out sos.louisiana.gov. There you'll be able to click onto the election section and check out any of the uh, races that will be happening in your area simply by clicking on sample ballot. I hope you find that interesting. We know I definitely did. Okay, and that is your news for September 11th, 2006. We'd like to remind you, Blue Mondays. Blue Mondays is on every single Monday night at 9 o'clock here on AOC Channel 15. We definitely want you to tune in and make this part of your regular Monday evening. Uh, the Left Blog appears every single Tuesday on the Advertiser's website, and that's at theadvertiser.com where I take a look at whatever the current issues are and I give you my thoughts and I also back it up with the truth and the links to the facts. Also, you'll want to check out Democracy Now! on Channel 16 at both 11 a.m. and 11 p.m. Join Amy Goodman and Juan Gonzalez uh, as they take a look at unembedded news from around the world. And, of course, last but not least, check out LafayetteDemocrats.org where you'll find all of the local information, news, and political uh, happenings that are going on uh, right now. Uh, you can also, uh, if you don't have internet access, give us a call. Our telephone number is 769-7347. That's our Democratic hotline. We'll be able to get you the information that you need and make sure that uh, we help you out any way we can. And with that, we'll be right back. When it rains, all my friends go away. God doesn't like me anymore. Santa won't know where to find me. You can drown in your bed if you fall asleep. And welcome back to Meet the Democrats. Uh, today, we are going to take a look at some of the local races on our continuing series on the ballot. Uh, today, I am lucky to be joined with Al Carre. Al, welcome to the show. Uh, and you are running for the school board for District 6, correct? That's correct. That's great. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, Stephen, we lifelong resident of Lafayette Parish. I'm 50 years old. I'm married. I have one son. Um, um, I uh, finished high school at Our Lady of Fatima. I, I went to UL. Uh, have a degree in English journalism, have another degree in English education. Uh, am a certified teacher, or was, before I went to law school and uh, went to Southern University Law School and been practicing law as a general practice since uh, 1989. Outstanding, outstanding. Uh, so, boy, the school board race. Uh, why did you decide to run for the school board? Well, really, you know, I'm interested in it. I really am. I, I, I've probably the past uh, six, seven years I've followed pretty closely the both legislative bodies in the city, the, the consolidated council and the, the school board. And, and I find the workings of each to be uh, uh, very, very interesting. They, they each operate in different ways. Uh, I like to compare and contrast them. Some things the consolidated government does better than the school board. Other things the school board does better than the Consolidated Council. So in that respect, it's just an intellectual curiosity and, and a willingness to serve and make the system better. That's great, because I'm sure we can, well, we definitely know we could use um, a lot better. When you take a look at uh, the school board, you know, one of the most interesting things that I take away from that is, is that 
you're truly making the investment in our future probably about a decade before it's going to pay off. That's correct. And by laying that groundwork, so really starting early and making sure that we get a good education for our kids is, is paramount. What do you think, where are some of our opportunities, at least in your opinion, where we could go? Well, you know, I've, I've talked to friends of mine who are, who are uh, in higher education, and, and there are some excellent, excellent websites uh, on the Board of Secondary, Elementary and Secondary Education. Uh, this, this gentleman turned me on to a, a site that was uh, dealt with high school redesign, uh, and it, it was a bunch of recommendations for taking education into the 21st century. And, and serving the needs of the students. Uh, how could you best uh, prepare a student for community college, technical college, university level work, and how do you integrate this stuff into workforce application, right. which is extremely important. Yeah, because it's got to translate over into real world. It is, and, and, that, and that's the, that, those were some of the recommendations of this uh, study on high school redesign, and, and I found it very interesting and probably very appropriate. You are right, change is slow, and, and to quote my friend, there is no single bullet, silver bullet for education. He said you really need a Gatling gun. Yeah. You know, so. Uh, really that's do. that's pretty much it, you know. Well, great. Well, you know, definitely in the area. You know, I was shocked when I came down here. I, I guess I was lucky to be uh, raised in a community that had a very small school board uh, for a city school, right. and um, we only my graduating class had um, a big class. We had 88 students in mm -hmm. our graduating class, but it was an incredible environment to to grow up in because. We all knew the school board members. Right. You know, we know them on a first name basis. It was such a small community. Sure. We've got a really large community here, yeah. and we've grown a great deal oh, yeah. just since last year. Definitely. We're definitely busting at the seams in the schools. How do we be better financial stewards of the money that we have to make sure that we're improving not only the physical plants, but Lord knows we could probably give our teachers a raise? What are we going to do? Well, <laughs> I told that I had an interview with the with the teachers union yesterday and I told them that I didn't want to throw out all kinds of ideas that always there's issues regarding uh, budget finances how do you how do you uh, take your money and make wise use of it and I, all I can say is that I I would be committed to studying the uh, the budget from top to bottom and attempting to see what is substantive and what maybe is not and and uh, just be a good steward of the taxpayers funds absolutely because Lord knows that I mean there there's so much improvement and there's so much of a need right now um, we have a great many um, well well first off we're, we're very diverse uh, we're starting some of these uh, schools I've heard that and I'm very interested in this because of my work here at AOC but Karen Crow is focusing on uh, 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 me media and uh, their uh, uh, kind of technologies Technology as well. Uh, that's amazing to me that we yes. can do that in our community. Do you foresee in the future of us being able to offer more of those types of programs? I would certainly hope so. I think that in the 21st century, it is a knowledge and information society. That's where we're going. We're, we're, we've left the old model and it's up to us to have all these classrooms wired, try to get as much technology into the hands of students, particularly students that come from poor, poor, uh, poor backgrounds. Uh, uh, poverty is, is great in some areas, and they do not have the ability maybe or the resources to have technology at their home. Yeah. And I've read a lot of studies that, that, that reaffirm that, that uh, position. So it is extremely important, I believe, uh, from not only uh, the the learning standpoint, but where they have to be in the job force down the line. Right. In order to get the, you know, we're constantly seeing a, a, an evolution in the larger political scheme of things, where we have job shifting. You know, uh, there for a while, you know, uh, back when uh, my grandparents and my father was young, uh, you were looking at a situation where. The big booming jobs were the industrial, you know, That's working correct. in big factories. Right. Um, we're, we're seeing those 
not nearly as much as we used to. No. Now we're going more into a technology world That's correct. and focusing on, on those types of things. So it's interesting that, you know, I, I really like that you're bringing up that, you know, the, the whole real world application of what they're being taught in school so that it can translate over into gainful employment. Definitely. And something that they're going to enjoy. Well, what else... Uh, what else would you like to tell the folks out there in Acadiana that are watching tonight? I'd just like to tell them that, that you know, I'm a former teacher. My wife was a former certified tenured teacher in the public school system. Uh, we talk education. All my friends, my best friends, even after 17 years of practicing law, my best friends are still people that I taught and coached with. And... Uh, it kind of stays in your blood. I love to talk with teachers and I love to get feedback from them because they're on the front line and my lines will always be open for for them to call me or email me. I love to get email, I love the technology and I think it, it's, uh, it's something, my door will always be open to them. That's you know? great, that's great to know. So how, what, what do you need from the viewing audience? Well I'm not much, I told the teachers union uh, Yesterday they asked me the same question, what can we do for you? And I told them, I'm not much to a on asking for money, okay? I pretty much uh, did my own signs, got them all up and running and paid for it myself. Uh, I say I'm an old-fashioned guy. Word of mouth is great. Uh, if you like me, if you think I'm the guy for the job, then just tell your neighbors. That's tell your neighbors and friends, and, and I'd appreciate it. And you're in District 6, right? So District that's pretty six. much the heartland area of, of Lafayette Parish. Covers Lafayette High and S.J. Montgomery and Myrtle Place and some other very fine schools. Outstanding. All right, well, you heard it here. Uh, that is Al Carre. He is running for school board District 6. Got to turn out to, uh, to vote. There is only one other person in this race, and he's from the, well, the other party. Uh, so we know who the right choice is here, uh, Lafayette Democrats. So make sure that you turn out on September 30th and vote for Al Carre on uh, September 30th uh, for School Board District 6. Thanks a lot, and we'll be right back. The hurricane has passed. But the recovery won't be complete until all the water has receded. If you're having trouble coping, trained and caring help is waiting. And we are back to meet the Democrats. In our next segment, we're going to do another, uh, another look into On the Ballot. On the Ballot's where we take a look at local candidates that are asking for your support here in the area. Uh, today we are joined by Mary Morrison. Mary, welcome to the program. Thank you. Good. Happy I'm really to glad to have you here. So you're running for the school board, correct? Yes, sir, I am. And that's am. in District 1. District 1. Great. That's well, right. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I, am, uh, I have a degree in business administration from the University of Phoenix. I am an instructor at Louisiana Technical College, a business instructor. I also, I am the advisor of the Student Government Association Medical Office Assistant Program, and I am the workplace literacy instructor there. So I have the opportunity to work with kids, which I really love, and that's one of the reasons why I am running, because I see lots of areas where we can improve what we do. Um, in the areas of getting our parents involved and also putting more money into our classrooms, making sure our students have the supplies that they need as well as the teachers and uh, look at our PTA meetings and trying to get our parents more involved and get those numbers up of the uh, parents that attend our PTA meetings. So Mary, what are some of the issues that are near and dear to your heart? You brought up just a few seconds ago, you brought up uh, things like making sure that the money's being spent actually in the classroom. You know, I gotta tell you, I'm loving hearing that. Uh, you know, uh, what are some other things, what are some ways that we can make some real differences? You know, uh, I met with uh, another candidate for the school board a little bit ago, and I talked to him about um, really that we're making an investment right now that's not going to be paying off probably for another decade because uh -huh. we're investing in our kids. Right. The, the best and most powerful resource that we have in our community. 
what are some of the other things that we can do in an area, in this area, to better the lives of our kids through the schools? Again, getting our parents more involved, that's the key. Yeah. And that is something that could be addressed immediately. We could see improvements in a few months. It's just getting them, letting them know that we want you here. We right. want you on the board. Work with our teachers and our students. The parent, teacher, and student relationship, I really believe, is the key to our success. You're right. However, we do need funds to supply them with uh, needed materials. Looking at our uh, high-risk kids, looking at mandatory tutoring for our high-risk kids would help out a whole lot. I'm planning on looking at going to the legislature in Baton Rouge and in Washington to find the resources, the funding resources for some of the programs. I understand that, you know, we have to have money to, in order to implement these things in our schools. However, I feel that um, we can um, find those resources. We just have to keep looking. Also, repairs in our school. Again, we need funding for our schools uh, in that way. Um, you know, I think that you bring up some really good points, and the, those are areas that I think a lot, oftentimes it's difficult for a lot of the local folks to kind of get their mind around uh, going to Baton Rouge and going to Washington and talking to our legislative folks. You know, I know Senator Landrieu and her staff work incredibly hard on there are a lot of different federal programs that we may not know about that they can help us. We're leaving money on the table by us not taking advantage of them. Absolutely, absolutely. Um... I have built some relationships with uh, some of our legislatures right. in Baton Rouge, and um, I am really looking forward to uh, contacting them and getting information and really looking hard and digging for for those resources. I know they are out there. We just yeah. have to go out there and find them. And do some digging for it. And do some know? digging and don't give up. That's there, great. I mean, there are so many things out there that will help us and funding programs in our schools. We just have to get out there and find them, and I'm ready to do that. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. I'm so glad to hear that. You know, um, I, I, I was uh, mentioning before that I went to a very small school system uh, up in Ohio, as where a nice, great public school system. I had a huge graduating class of 88 students, um, and it was a big shock for me coming down here seeing the huge schools that we have, and we actually have campuses where kids are going to classrooms and stuff. And uh, kind of difficult to see, though, how many portable classrooms that we have out there. So, and it's so difficult um, you looking for this position because you're going to have, I mean, it's going to be the rough decisions of physical plant versus teachers versus all of the other things that we have to spend money on. But hearing you say that you want to make sure that that money goes to the classroom is vital. Absolutely. It's vital. It's the key. And we want to keep our kids excited excited and motivated about learning and we don't want to give them a reason a right. reason not to show up in class or not to uh, fulfill their dreams our kids of today they're challenging kids they're really challenging and that's why it's so important for us as a system to assist our students in their success they need each and every one of us. They need their teachers, their school bus drivers, the cafeteria workers, the janitors, everyone that touched their lives, they need. Yeah. And we bring the parents on board, and it seems like, how can we lose? Absolutely. And then we find the money to fund those programs. How can we lose? You're absolutely right. It's the investment that we have to make. I mean, it has to be that priority. It's so good. It's so good to hear uh, this coming from a person like yourself, who's really respected in the community, who is giving of yourself to say, "I'm going to get into this," because I mean, it's a kind of a big risk. What was the deciding factor? What finally made you decide that you're going to run for this position? Well, uh, I am an instructor, and I work with kids on a day-to-day -day basis, and I look at those little faces, and they depend on us so much. And Miss Morrison, Miss Morrison. Uh, how did I do? Or just waiting for me to say uh, something uplifting and motivate them. They just depend on me so much. And I said, I can do more. Yes. I can do more. And that's the main reason why I'm running is for my students, to see them successful, to give them what they need. Because they I'm are so very much that. capable. They are. They just need us to really kind of help them 
help them get there. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, one of the things that I've been really interested in, probably because, you know, uh, uh, of all the work that I do here at AOC, but hearing that in Karen Crow, in your district, actually, we have a school that's focusing on technology. Yes. In the high school. That's amazing to me. Um, And I hear that they're thinking of more programs and stuff to possibly be offering throughout the parish. Do you see that as part of our future? Absolutely, absolutely. What we're doing with our schools, Karen Crow High, Katie Anna High, uh, Katie Anna High's business, we have Northside is engineering, Lafayette High is health sciences, and Como is of the arts. What, what this does for our community is it gives the kids a choice of interest. Whatever they're interested in, they could attend any school of choice. And what the schools are implementing is that They're giving the students an opportunity to actually work in the workforce as to have a practicum and an internship and really gets them really motivated and encouraged about what they're doing. So I think it's just wonderful. We're definitely headed in the right direction. That's so great. I mean, I can't tell you the amount of excitement that uh, I have just knowing that a lot of times it's very difficult for kids to plug in and realize, okay, why am I studying the Civil War? You know, why am I studying, you know, know what happened in 1892 you know how's that going to affect me when I get out in the world and these are giving them practical tools that they can literally get their diploma in one hand as they get their first paycheck in the next absolutely and that is amazing I mean to see that and not only that but they are interested they're interested they're going to apply themselves more in the core basics of their math courses and their science courses while they're it because they're excited to go to their next class which is on video production or what have you. That's amazing to me. It is. It really is amazing. And um, thus far, the program has really is really successful, That's very great. successful. And uh, the programs are really working very closely with industry. Pro- the high schools and industry are working very closely together. Outstanding. I'm so glad to hear that. Well, why don't you sum it up for us? Uh, do you have any other final points that you'd like to make? Yes, um, I would like to say that I am for the complete system. I am here for our students as well as the complete system because it takes all of us to accomplish the goals that we are setting out to accomplish. Um, our support workers, administrative staff that are part of the school board, they are concerned with uh, pay scales and all, and I know that I will be fair. I will be fair to everyone in that area. However, our students is our main concern and our and is very very important about what we do because what we do is for our students. So Absolutely. with that in mind, I well know, said. That's what well my said. goal is. Well, that is. Uh, this has been uh, Mary Morrison. She is running for school board district one. Uh, she uh, definitely needs you to make sure that you turn out. Mark your calendar, September 30th. Get out there and vote. Uh, the polls will be open the entire day, very early in the morning to in the evening. So make sure that you turn out and vote. District 1 for Mary Morrison for the, uh, for, I almost said the Supreme Court, uh, <laughs> for the school board uh, here in Lafayette Parish. Uh, this has been another uh, break from On the Ballot. We'll be back in just a few minutes. Thanks. We make a pledge. We keep our word. When America works, America prospers, so my economic security plan can be summed up in one word, jobs. The No Child Left Behind Act is opening the door of opportunity to all of America's children. Our budget will run a deficit that will be small and short term. We should and must provide the best care for anybody who's willing to put uh, their life in harm's way. We make a pledge, we mean it. We keep our word. We keep our word. The Democratic National Committee is responsible for the content of this advertisement. My family's counting on me. Do we rebuild? How can we go on? I'm so tired. Is it even worth it? I'm not sure I can be strong. How do I find a job? I don't even make sure he is strong.
In the last century, Americans organized as our nation moved from a farm past to a factory present. Faced with gaping wealth disparities, corruption of our political process, destruction of nature, and a workforce unprepared for a changing economy, these leaders formed a new vision for democracy. Today, we again see the dawn of a new era, from an assembly line past to an interconnected information future. And we must again rebuild our democratic community, one that stands for a world-class education, an economy that is both healthy and fair, a thriving natural environment, healthy people with accessible health care, a secure nation with international credibility, and working elections and engaged citizens that make all of this possible. Not bigger government, not smaller government, but better government. Not left, not right, but forward. The Democratic Party, America's Party. Today I am joined, I'm sitting down with uh, the local Lafayette Parish Democratic Executive Committee Chairman, Frank Flynn. Frank, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you for inviting me. No problem, we'd love to have you any time. So we thought in talking back and forth via email that we'd actually give a chance and we'd talk about uh, all these candidates that we have running because it might be kind of confusing for some folks out there. So why don't we go through and take a look at some of these races that we have shaping up. First and foremost, probably the biggest ticket item is Secretary of State, correct? That's right. There's a special election coming up uh, with a lot of the municipality elections, uh, September 30th. Uh, so that we're less than 30 days away. And one of the bigger races is the Secretary of State uh, race, and I'm pleased to say that uh, Francis Heichmeyer, uh, a seasoned veteran uh, in the state Senate, uh, has uh, uh, entered the race. Uh, he, he's well financed with reference to, apparently he's got a lot of constituents that have believed in him through the years. Uh, I've taken a look at his record, and I'm most impressed with the fact that he says the number one priority with reference to the Secretary of State's office is to ensure fair and honest elections. And uh, you do that by having the voting machines, uh, uh, good voting machines, have a backup uh, paper trail, make sure that the machines are, are maintained uh, so and tested before they go out uh, to the site, to election right. site. Uh, and that's his number one priority, and I think that here... Uh, in Louisiana as in the, any other state in the Union. That's what everybody wants. Oh, Whether absolutely. you're a Democrat, Independent, Republican, you want fair and honest elections. We're, We're dealing with new voting machines this time yeah. around. Well, let me tell you, our, we had the greatest voting machines and they were tested when uh, um, the uh, when Mary Landrieu first ran for office. Uh, her opponent uh, and Mary uh, had a race, a, um, Lewis Jenkins was his name. Um, they had a race within 5,000 votes. So what that came down to was an accurate, they needed an accurate count of the 5,000 or so precincts in Louisiana and the machines uh, proved that they were accurate and there were some alleged irregularities and uh, the official count, the, the count that uh, give or take a few votes uh, was uh, deemed accurate. So we had great machines, and I'm proud to say that the same company that was working on those machines are responsible for the new computerized uh, machines with uh, the paper backup. So that's, uh, to me, it's reassuring. At the last election, I saw actually how it worked, and uh, they're getting all the kinks out. So we're going to have a good count come uh, September 30th, and I am very pleased that Francis Heichmeyer uh, has said that that's one of his number one uh, priorities is to uh, manage that. And I believe him because he's been in the state senate, he's run for elected office, he knows the importance of it, and he's not a bureaucrat. So these other races, we've got some other, the surrounding municipalities in the parish uh, that are running, and we're going to talk specifically about Lafayette Parish since that's the committee that you and I both serve on. Um, but the outline areas, we're now seen in five parishes now, so we urge you to reach out and check the Secretary of State's website and find out who the candidates are in your area. Let me just start off with the mayor's race. They have a mayor's, uh, hotly contested mayor's race. Uh, in Broussard. Now, Charlie Longanay is uh, uh, a Democrat. Uh, he's uh, moderate, conservative. Uh, 
But you need to look beyond, uh, you need to look at the person, you know, wh whatever the, the party label is. But uh, Charlie Longanay uh, has been in office for, uh, I believe, eight years. And he had a heated race last time where uh, he won by 100 votes. And I think since that election night, he's doubled his efforts uh, to uh, to do a much uh, to do a, a much improved job in Broussard, and ever since four years ago, uh, Charlie has had the, the good fortune of uh, building uh, neighborhoods and building roads, building shopping centers. There's a lot of uh, economic development in Broussard, and there's a lot of uh, neighborhood development, and that's a tribute to uh, Charlie Longanay and uh, his uh, refortified efforts to to be very progressive. So I'm, I'm very proud of, of what he's done in, in Bruce Hort over the last, I think it's five seats, yeah, five seats in the city of Bruce Hort for council uh, person. Uh, I would like to, to congratulate Terry Gilbo. He was uh, uh, the candidate for district number one. He's an incumbent and he's an incumbent Democrat and, and one unopposed. Uh, so that was good news for him. The um, in District 4, the um, Gertrude Baptiste, who is on the Housing Authority, and Cynthia Jaquet, who is the, uh, the, nep the niece of Harold Johnson and has uh, some uh, qualifications on her own, should make for a very uh, good race. I mean, I think there's going to be a lot of discussions of the issues in the District 4 race and uh, the importance of that race. It looks like when all is said and done that there will probably be uh, two uh, Democratic uh, councilmen uh, in Bruce Hoard, hopefully with the Democratic mayor. Let me talk uh, just a moment about uh, Dusan. Dusan, they have uh, the mayor, uh, John Longanay, he was up for re-election, but nobody saw fit to run against him, and I think that's because he, he's done a remarkably great job uh, with reference to... Uh, raising funds uh, and having surplus for the uh, projects that are going on in, in Doosan. In fact, I think he did such a great job that when the legislature met, there was a couple of projects or grants that there was a question about whether Doosan could get it because they had some money, and uh, Longanay should be credited with uh, building the tax base over uh, in Doosan. What's really exciting in Doosan this uh, go-around is the uh, chief of police uh, we have a Democratic incumbent, uh, Ronald Lewis, who I think has been in office two terms, and uh, he draws opposition every time, and I don't know why that is. I think it's because in a small community, uh, police chief is an important position, and people see things different ways, and uh, sometimes they're looking for a change. I look for a B, there's probably going to be a runoff in that race, and I look for the Democrat to, to do well and... Uh, too close to call right now, but uh, we'll have to come back and talk in October. That's right. The, um, and there's six uh, aldermen seats uh, up. There's five seats up, but there's six candidates running. And uh, I'm pleased to say that all six candidates are uh, Democrats. I know uh, several of them personally, and... Uh, from what I understand is the candidate with the most votes uh, in the alderman race uh, becomes uh, mayor pro tem. In other words, he'll sit in when the, the mayor's out of town. Karen Crow's a, a good area. The um, Carlos Stute is the chief of police there and he's drawn opposition from the old uh, um, chief of police, uh, Timmy Duyon. I do note that uh, Timmy's a Republican. I think that's a recent occurrence since, since Timmy's uh, lost the last time out. Um, but anyway, from what I understand is that the qualifications, uh, Carlos Stute ran on his qualifications and he, he had a lot of experience and that's what carried him over uh, the la uh, four years ago. I suspect that's probably what's going to happen uh, this time. So I'm looking to see that seat, uh, Chief of Police being Democrat. And uh, the way it works out um, in Karen Crow, five seats, uh, the, the candidates, the top five that get uh, the most votes uh, will then go in 
uh, as um, as councilman. The uh, we have a lot of good Democrats uh, running the race. Uh, Alan Conk. Uh, we have Dean Fusile, uh J. L. Reshore. Uh, you've got Bobby Badon and uh, Anthony Babineau. A lot. Uh, uh, yes, and Al Senegal. Oh. Yeah. I expect that in that that election, you'll ha since it's so local and there's so many good candidates running that um, you'll have a good turnout. Lafayette's surrounded by the the Democrats. You know sure the uh, let's see with the chief of police. Let's see who our candidates are. Yeah, we've got Chad Leger, uh right? He's the incumbent. He's the incumbent. Right. And uh, but he has some opposition in Paul Broussard, who's the Republican. Yeah. Now I think that's just. Uh, uh, and I don't know either candidate personally, but uh, I would think that Chad has done his homework. Yeah, with well, the uh starting probably before Stafford Boudreaux have been uh, fam old families in Scott, and I'm sure uh, Bob is related to to Stafford. Uh, might be a grandson or a great grandson. Uh, so and I, I, I've, I've met their family, and they they take their politics serious. So. I would think that uh, Bob Boudreaux is going to be looking for every vote, vote just like uh, Danny Oye will be. So, the Lafayette Parish School Board, you know, I'm sure each of the members have put in an extra amount of time and energy, uh, but there's some changes that need to be made, and I, I think that the school board needs to revisit uh, the class size issue. To develop a child's educational capabilities is. Uh, in pre-K through third grade, and I think it's critically important. And the the store uh, the scores back it up that there's tremendous uh, development and potential during those grades. Uh, but look, the school board can't do it all by itself. The sure. primary responsibility rests with the the student and the family. Lafayette is very progressive. They need a, a very progressive educational agenda. Um, I'm looking to. Uh, to tout uh, Albert Kyrie, uh, Al and I were in school, in high school and grammar grades. He's a couple of years younger than me, but uh, he he comes from a disciplined background. He was a coach, I think, at Father Turling's high school. In fact, his, his track team did, did very well, but he also, uh, uh, school, I mean, he, he was a teacher, uh, so he's an educator, uh, but he the most important thing about uh, Al Kyrie is that he's very reasoned. Yeah. I mean, he's, uh, and he's not going to let the, uh, anybody's agenda or any party agenda get in the way of doing the right thing. I mean, he's, uh, a solid individual and he's going to do a remarkable job. Uh, Ray Trahan, who is, uh, president or past president of the boat bus, uh, uh, Bus Drivers Association uh, is now on the board, so she'll have some uh, unique insight. I do think that the, the bus drivers got a bad rap, and uh, with reference to some of the public relations issues that, that flew around, they didn't uh, get the public relations they needed to, to show what a great job they do in safely bringing the kids uh, from the house to the school and then back from school to the house. I don't know Mary, and I don't know uh, Russell Meyer, uh, I, I am glad to see that uh, Lafayette uh, Chamber of Commerce and the uh, Southwest, uh, the African American Chamber right. of Commerce are coming together uh, to uh, exchange, I mean, to discuss the issues and right. to exchange ideas because that's what we are about, is about community here in Lafayette right. and uh, more organizations need to get involved with reference to public education issues. Well, I just hope everybody goes out and votes, and I hope it's a good good uh, day to vote, meaning that the weather's good right. so that nobody will have an excuse. You know? right. It's like uh, in some elections uh, across the board we have low turnouts. Other elections when there's a lot of issues, a lot of money spent uh, on campaigns, the voter turnout's a little bit higher. I like to see uh, the voter turnout high when there's – no real money spent when there's some real issues discussed, and that's when we know that uh, that uh, we we've got a consensus going in the that's parish. Right.
Well, I couldn't have said any better, so I'm not going to try. This has been uh, Frank Flynn. He is the chairman of the Lafayette Parish Democratic Executive Committee. Uh, and we thank him for being on the show tonight. Thank Thanks. You. And regretfully, we are out of time. That has been another episode of Blue Mondays Meet the Democrats. Uh, I'm Stephen Handwork. I want to thank you for tuning in uh, to us. Tune in to us each and every Monday night at 9 o'clock on AOC Channel 15. With that, good night. Thank you.